its third year, there comes to the people of North America the first real sacrifice of daily convenience, restrictions on the consumption of gasoline and lubricants. Within a few weeks, whole communities have organized to eliminate unnecessary driving for pleasure and even business. Unaccustomed as they may be to discomfort, commuters all across Canada are complying with urgent government requests that gasoline be rigidly conserved. And as the seven o'clock curfew goes into operation, millions of citizens of the Western Hemisphere realize that to their doorstep has come that fiercest of modern battles, the worldwide battle for oil. Today, oil is the most precious single substance the Earth produces. And the great oil fields are the most vital strategic centers of the globe. In the heat of Texas, Mexico, and Venezuela stand the massed derricks of the Caribbean basin largest oil field in the world. And while the hoses spurt their streams of liquid wealth into the tankers, oil for the US Navy, oil for Britain, oil for China, American cruisers keep guard in the gateways of the Pacific Ocean, and patrol bombers sweep above the island approaches to the Gulf of Mexico. Far away in the heart of the old world, stretching from the Caspian Sea to the Persian Gulf, lies the great central Eurasian oil field. Here in the Caucasus, in the face of renewed German onslaughts, Soviet troops throw a ring of steel around the wells of Baku. For on the oil of Baku and the great distribution center of Batum on the Black Sea, the whole Red Army depends for its continued resistance to Hitler. To the south, across the deserts of Iraq and Syria, heavily guarded by British and free French troops, run the all-important pipelines to Haifa and Tripoli. Subject to constant air attack are these storage tanks on the coast of Palestine, storage tanks vital to Britain's Mediterranean fleet. And up in the hinterland, on the great Iranian plateau stands the richest single oil field in the world, crucial to allied land and sea forces in the Middle East. And as Riza Shah Pahlavi abdicates in favor of his 21-year-old son, British and Soviet patrols occupy the mountain roads of Iran. And in the cities of Tehran and Tabriz, Nazi tourists and saboteurs are herded out across the frontier Eastward again, in the jungles of Sumatra, Java, and Borneo, stand the oil wells of the Dutch East Indies. And as the pumps feed the precious fuel to democracy's far eastern bases, Hubertus van Mock, far-seeing economics minister of the Netherlands Indies government, plays for time against the oil demands of Axis partner, Japan. Plays for time, while Hollander and Indonesian alike rush to strengthen the already formidable defenses of their islands. For well they know that the flag of the rising sun, moving swiftly southward, is now within bombing distance of Borneo. And if it floated above the oil plants of the Dutch East Indies, Japan would be independent of foreign supplies. Key to the defense of the Indies oil fields is the mighty fortress of Singapore where Air Chief Marshal Sir Robert Brooke Popham plans the disposition of Britain's Far Eastern battle lines. Thus, wherever there is oil, the democracies stand guard, for on their control of the world's major oil fields hangs liberty itself. Less than a century ago, on a world which had hitherto thought in terms of horse and steam power, 
broke the news of the discovery in far off places of a dark, chemically neutral substance. Liquid, viscid, insoluble in water, a substance explosively inflammable. Crude oil. Within a few years, among the ruins of empires which once ruled the world, the roar of drilling machinery ushered in a new era. As the whirling pits bored down through thousands of feet of sand and rock, there was born a revolution in strategic thinking that was soon to affect every great military and naval power. And first to seize on the vast strategic possibilities of oil was Britain's Royal Navy. Since the 18th century, the sea power, which is Britain's strength, has rested upon the cruising range of her ships, upon their ability to bring their guns to bear anywhere on the high seas at any moment. But in the days of coal, the range of each ship was strictly limited. Coal was an awkward fuel to store at sea, bulky and wasteful of space in the bunkers. For this reason, Britain built and maintained her great naval bases across the world, a chain of coaling stations to enable patrolling warships to refuel frequently. But in the months preceding World War I, two British shipyards engaged in top speed construction of new battleships came a now famous order from the First Lord of the Admiralty. Redesign boilers and fire rooms to burn oil fuel. Winston Churchill. Easier to store, giving fiercer heat to the boilers, liquid oil could be carried in far greater quantities than coal. From that day on, a battleship clearing from her British base could cruise from Portsmouth to Colombo, 9,000 miles without a single stop for fuel. Overnight, the Royal Navy found in oil a far wider power of movement the power to get there first and hit with overwhelming strength. Seldom has the range and power of oil fuel at sea been better demonstrated than on the day when a patrol plane far out in the North Atlantic reported the presence of the Bismarck heading down from the Arctic Circle to prey on Allied convoys. A warning note of Morse tapped out across the vastness of the sea. And far away below the horizon, destroyers, with oil tanks filled to capacity, spread their net across the Atlantic. From the south, giant battleships, with oil enough to remain at sea for days on end, began their steady combing of the ocean. And most deadly of all, the aircraft carriers, with their high speed and long cruising range, launching whole squadrons of torpedo bombers to cover thousands of miles in a few hours. Before ever the first guns spoke, the Bismarck's fate was sealed. Sooner or later, with the staying power afforded by oil fuel, the great guns were bound to find their target. Seeking for new means of conquest by the established German strategy of sudden attack over land, the Nazi generals found in gasoline and diesel oil the motive power for one of the most terrible offensive weapons ever known, combined assault by bombers and mechanized ground forces. Every time the panzers roll across new frontiers, the problem of the high command becomes ever more acute. 
to keep their gas tanks fed with fuel. With little oil of her own, and with few foreign sources open to her, Germany has been forced to build some 25 giant plants for obtaining oil artificially from coal. But synthetic oil costs three times as much as natural oil, and its production is slow and complex. Small wonder that the Panzer supply lines are organized to peak pitch for conservation. To race an engine is verboten. Accidents causing traffic jams involve court-martial. And by such rigid methods of saving fuel, Germany managed to conquer all Western Europe on 12 million gallons of gasoline, less than America can produce in three days. But even this small quantity drained Europe of its oil stocks. In the conquered countries today, Hitler's new order is horse-drawn. Tractors must rust in barns to enable the Wehrmacht to move. For the oil resources of Europe are inadequate, even for peacetime needs. And he who would master and reorganize the continent must turn east to seize the rich wells of Soviet Russia. furious battle for oil now raging on the Russian front and from the slaughter and destruction in the wheat fields of the Ukraine, one fact emerges to face the Nazi warlords. In Russia, they have used more fuel than in all their previous campaigns combined. At all costs, they must have the Soviet wells of Baku. Meanwhile, the RAF launches its mass attacks on the synthetic fuel plants on which Germany's striking power depends. To every bomber crew goes the order, look for the fuel plants and the storage dumps and give them the works. Nightly, in the glare of burning oil and the bombed communications essential to its transportation, the Nazi leaders see the specter they dread most. Panzers and Luftwaffe alike stalled and impotent for lack of fuel. But across the channel, too, as dust falls each night, the guns turn skyward to protect Britain's storage tanks from counterattack. For as her preparations for offensive action grow daily more complete, Britain knows that she will need more oil than ever before. For every round trip to Berlin, made by each new long-range bomber delivered to the RAF, 3,800 gallons of high-test spirit will be required. Every armored division joining the swiftly growing mechanized army may consume more than 50,000 gallons of gasoline in a single day's fighting. And on one voyage alone, the great new battleships will burn 750,000 gallons of bunker oil, enough to heat the average home for three and a half centuries, and every drop of it must be imported from overseas. But today, a common sight in North American ports are survivors from British tankers sunk in mid-Atlantic witnesses of German attempts to cut Britain's main oil supply line from the States. For the Battle of the Atlantic has become Britain's battle for oil. To 
every U-boat and raider, the German Admiralty issues these instructions. Your first objective will be the tankers. As Britain's oil crisis grows more acute, America speaks through oil controller Harold Dickies. The oil industry and government officials are agreed that we must act at once. The Battle of the Atlantic is being fought with oil and will be won by oil. It has finally reached into American garages and gasoline tanks. Today, for the first time, the richest oil producing land in the world takes drastic steps to prevent gasoline wastage. For in order to keep the oil flowing to Britain, the people of the U.S. transfer some 80 of their coastwise tankers to the British service, thereby temporarily sacrificing part of their own domestic supply. At the same time, Canada moves to conserve tanker space, pressing every railroad car into service to haul her oil supplies north from the States by land instead of sea. And eastward, the woods of Maine and Quebec echo to the chug of steam shovels as the new international pipeline is laid. The pipeline which will release for war duty the tankers now running between Portland and Montreal. All important in these plans for reducing seaborne oil imports is Canada's own oil field, Turner Valley, in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Among the most carefully planned oil fields in the world, Turner Valley now produces one-sixth of all Canada's needs. Daily, from the Calgary refineries, the tank trucks pull out to distribute fuel all across the West. Fuel for farmers, for the prairie bases of the air training plan, for war industries from Winnipeg to Edmonton. Foreseeing a coming demand for more home-produced oil to meet the Dominion's rising war needs, the Alberta government now plans the controlled expansion of the Turner Valley field. Deep into the bush go experts with test equipment, searching for fresh underground deposits of oil. Then come the drill teams and the pipe laying crews, bringing new wells and new lines of supply into operation. So today, as her new wells blow into production, Canada takes her place as a nation deeply concerned in the strategy of oil. And in the tankers steaming seaward from their ports, her citizens will measure the success of their program of gasoline conservation. For though there is fuel for Britain in plenty, in the grim struggle to get it to her, every tanker freed for service in the Atlantic is another step to victory in the worldwide battle for oil. Thank <laughs> you.